Well, thanks everybody for coming out tonight. We're going to pick up again in the Gospel of John in our study. So if you want to turn to John chapter 17 tonight, we're going to, uh, well, let me put it to you this way. Turn to John 17. But what I want us to do first, before I start reading there, just to give us a thought so I can dive into the thought, would you kind of keep your marker there and turn to your right and look at Hebrews chapter 7, would you? And I want to read a couple verses uh, that point to Jesus Christ and his office um, as a high priest, but something about him in the office of high priest. When you're in Hebrews 7, just say, I'm there. Okay, good. Verse 24 says in Hebrews 7, says, but Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Verse 25 is where I want to zero in on. Therefore, he is able also to save those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Did you catch that? So what we have here is we have Jesus, who is God in the flesh, he holds the office of high priest according to the writer of Hebrews. And one, one of his things that he does is he always, he always lives to make intercession. He's forever making intercession. And the reason why he can forever do that is because why? He is a forever being. He always was. He always will be. So he's forever. So he's praying for us is what it, in simple, simple terms. Now here's the question. And here's what I want to talk about tonight. I want to talk about... Um, you know, what does Jesus pray for you and I? Because he does pray certain things for us. He's an interceder for us. And so the whole question is, would you like to know what he prays for you? Would you like to know what he's ever interceding about you? Now, remember, let's get the whole picture again because Jesus has now left the Last Supper inside. He gave inside teaching. He's now marching across Jerusalem in the night moonlight skies, probably full moon. He sees, they can see the, the Temple Mount there, it's massive, and they're going to cut over the Kidron Valley. You'll read specifically that as we go next week into the betrayal of Jesus in the garden. But he's walking in the moonlight, and now he's outside, and he's giving teaching that pertains to outside, to how we walk and live and act outside in our faith, outside in this world. Now, as he walks now, he comes to this moment in time where he's going to look up at the Father. You'll see that in verse 1. And he's going to begin to talk to God. He's not going to talk to the disciples anymore. The disciples hear it, but he's not talking to them. What he's actually doing as he walks now, and the disciples are following him, and as he moves down the Kidron Valley, moving up to the Garden of Gethsemane, he is praying for the disciples. And in there, we're going to see five different things that he prays. And he prays it for them, and he prays it for you, and he prays it for me. And they're really cool things that he prays and that he ever intercedes for you and I. Do you guys want to know what those are? So would I. Oh, no, I'm just joking. I'll teach you. So here we go. John chapter 17. Turn back there and look at verse 1. And it says this. Jesus spoke these things and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, uh, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Now, this is a really, there's two cool things I want to just pick out real quick in there. And that is that Jesus says, as he's talking to the Father, he wants to glorify the Father. Now, isn't that kind of like the ultimate purpose of our life, that we want to glorify God in everything we do, right? Am I right on that one? We want to glorify God. It's, and look, and none of us gets it right every time, so don't panic, okay? But we do try to glorify God and live for God and be a good example of that. But it also says in that text right there, he talks about, you know, the hour. Father, the hour has come. Now, if you've been read through John or you've been with us in Bible study, you know that we've been seeing this term, the hour, pop up periodically, correct? And one of the places we do, I'm sure you'll remember it, is remember at the wedding of Cana when they run out of wine? And his mom says to him, like a good mom, because she's helping with all the stuff, they've run out of wine. And Jesus tells his mother, woman, which is not a bad term. It's like my lady. It's a really respectful term. He says, uh, woman, my hour has not yet come. In other words, he's saying, it's not time for me. It's not time for me to do specifically what I'm supposed to do. And we know that as the crucifixion and resurrection. The hour has not come. And so now we see in this moment of time, 
in verse 1, he says to the Father, the hour has come. Now is the moment. Everything that had to be done up to this moment has been done. And now we're going to get on with the main reason of why I came. So here we go. <clears throat> Jesus' prayer, number one in your notes. And the first thing in your notes is this. He prays for our salvation, which means he prays for the salvation of everyone. And so we see that in verse 2 and verse 3. Watch this. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. Now he's going to explain to you what eternal life is. And when Jesus explains it, pay attention. He says in verse 3, this is eternal life, that they may say the word, that they may know you, the only true God. There's only one God, true God, that's God. And Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. We know there's three persons and the one Godhead. But notice that he's praying for people to come to salvation, that they may know you. Guys, if that's his prayer for humanity, that should be our prayer for humanity. I know my wife and I, we pray nightly. Um, and I always tell, try to tell people, don't worry, we don't pray for an hour and a half and put on worship music. Don't just pat, don't pat, okay, don't look, go home and say, well, Jim said you got to pray. No, no, we pray for about anywhere from three minutes to maybe five minutes. That's just about it, okay? So don't put too much pressure on yourself there. And I always have to put that there because so people will pray and not feel like I have to go a long time. No, you don't. But when we pray, the bulk of our prayer time is for salvation. We pray for the salvation, and one of our specifics is we're praying for the salvation for one last wave of salvation over America. That there be just one last big move of God over my country. Just, I just, we pray for that every night. We pray specifically, I, we pray for Hollywood. We pray for their salvation. We name producers, we name directors, actors, actresses, singers, script writers, et cetera, et cetera. We, name, we pray for them. We just pray for them. We just pray for political leaders for their salvation. We continuously pray for these things because we want to see people saved. Jesus comes along and he says, and he begins to pray for the salvation of people. Now, look at the word in there. You don't have to look at it, but the word no, K-N-O-W, salvation. That word simply means this, to get knowledge of. But here's what's interesting about that word, that they may know you. He's Jesus saying, that they may know you, Father in heaven. The word K-N-O-W, know there, that word there, the Greek word, is the idea in a Jewish idiom of sexual intercourse. That's the idea of how they use that word. So when you think of it in that term, that's the most intimate relation, thing in a relationship you could possibly have. Any amens on that? It's okay to say amen on that term, okay? So, so you see how... This whole salvation thing is a personal relationship. It's not, well, I know there's a God. Oh, I, yeah, I believe there's a Jesus. That's not salvation. That will not get anyone anywhere. It's that you may know God, that you may know his son, that you may have intimate relationship with your Savior, that you are with him, as we said on Sunday. Amen to that one? Now, let's read verse 4. I glorified you on the earth having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, he says, I have accomplished. I finished the work that you gave me to do. Question, what did he, what did he accomplish? It's the cross? Has he died yet? So he's not talking about that. I, I, I reeled you in there, okay, on purpose. But thank you for going for it, okay? Just don't pop the air out of my tires tonight, okay? So, like, <laughs> so he hasn't done that yet. He has not gone to the cross. He has not risen from the dead, but he says, I've accomplished the work. So the question is, what's the work he's accomplished, right? What's he done up to this point that is so important that he even makes a statement to the Father, I've accomplished this. Let me tell you what he's done. He has shown people what God the Father is really like. Has he not? He came to show everybody because they had a, um, a false image of who God the Father was. They had everything confused. I mean, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they had so twisted the way God was. Now, keep your marker right here, and let's go back in John and just look at one statement about that in John chapter 1. 
Go back to John chapter 1, way back at the beginning when we first started studying this book, and watch one of the statements there. <clears throat> now look at verse 18, and it says this in John 1. No one has seen God at any time, the only begotten God, who is in the bosom of the Father. He has explained Him. So now we find in the beginning, Jesus comes on the scene, and He's going to explain the Father. And the idea of the word explain there just means to unfold in teaching. He's going to unpack who Jesus is so people will now have a clear understanding of who Jesus is. And therefore, if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the, the Father. So it works that way. So we get a clear understanding of who God is. Now back to John chapter 17. Look at verse 5. Verse 5 says, Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself. Now watch this cool statement with the glory which I had with you before the world was. What does that tell us about Jesus? He's eternal. He always was. Remember at the beginning of John? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's, he's way back in the beginning. He started it all. How about Genesis 1.1? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So He always was, Period. And so right here he confirms that he's eternal. He was with the Father before all this stuff. Now, verse 6. He says, I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now think about what he just said. I have manifested your name to these people, to humanity. Question. How did he manifest the name of God to people? How did he do that? No, you got to think about it. It's very simple arithmetic here. Remember when, um, remember when Moses is at the burning bush and God says, I want you to go to Egypt and I want you to tell Pharaoh, let my people go, right? He wants to send him. And so do you remember one of Moses, or one of his main question that he asked God in that interaction? Who shall I say send me? Who's he? And he says, what name shall I give them? And what does God say? I am. I am. Okay, I am. So Jesus in John chapter 8 now, and he says, before Abraham was born, I, I am. He goes, I was the guy at the burning bush. That's what Jesus says. Now, you take I am, which is very holy words to the Jewish person. You take that. And Jesus used that as John writes down, recollecting, writes all these things down. His I am statement always led to something about him, right? To one of his qualities, correct? And that was a key thing. Now, some of the terms were, Jesus said, I am the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. I am the, the door. I am the, the vine. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection and the life. And so as he's moving along, and remember John at the end of the book that we saw at the beginning, we, we'll see in John later on, that John wrote these things, these are signs so people would believe. And every time Jesus made an I am statement, he backed it up and he qualified it, and he's giving people understanding about God the Father. He's manifesting God the Father in these I am statements. It's incredible what he's doing. Now, let's look at verse seven. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me I have given to them, and they received them and truly understood that I came forth from you, and they believed that you sent me. I ask on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Verse 10. <clears throat> and all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have glorified, and I have been glorified in them. Now, Let's get to point two. Jesus' prayer. He prays for our fellowship. That's your second point in your notes there. He prays for our fellowship. Now, verse 11 backs up that point. Watch this. He says, I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be what? One, even as we are. So he prays for Christian folk to be united in oneness. Correct? 
to be in fellowship, one and united. Is it easy to stay united? Think of your families. Any division in your families tonight? Some of you have divisions been going on for years, huh? Division happens so fast and over some of the dumbest things, does it not? Same thing in a church setting. People can start dividing over all kinds of things that, oh my gosh, and when you've been in church as long as I have, you've seen so many of these things happen. Now, do Christians agree on everything? The answer is no. And should never expect Christians to agree on everything. Now, I've had three statements in there um, that I did not come up with. Some of you have read those statements before. We'll fill them in, but they've been around for hundreds of years. But they're great. Uh, They've been attributed to Martin Luther, but some people say, no, it wasn't him. I can't remember who else it was attributed to. But here's how how you create unity and fellowship, because the fellowship of a body of believers, a local church, can be divided as fast as your families at home could be divided. So how do we stay in unity? How do we watch these things? Now, the first one is, in essentials, we have unity. In essentials, we have unity. I'm going to fill them all in for you, then I'm going to talk about it. In non-essentials, we have liberty. In all things, we show love. So the words are unity, liberty, and love. Unity, liberty, and love. Now, let me explain it. Um... In, in, in the essentials, uh, we have unity. Look, when it comes to the virgin birth, guess what? That's a fact. When it comes to the blood of Jesus to forgive our sins, that's a fact. We don't, we, don't, we don't mess with that whatsoever. When it comes to Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, that's what it is. That, that's, we all agree on things like that, and we have unity. That's just what it is. Now, you have the middle piece. In the non-essentials, we have liberty. Okay, sis, you told me I felt like I was in a Pentecostal church, and I said, because I'm Pentecostal, right? Well, let me key off that for just for a second, okay? Now, I believe very strongly, the scriptures are clear, it's not just because I believe it, it's clear, that we can all be baptized in power in the Holy Spirit, that we can speak in our spiritual language called tongues. Now, with that said, that's a non-essential. You don't have to do that to be saved or be a Christian, Correct? It's a non-essential. So if you choose to go down and, and take on that from take those things from the Holy Spirit, great. But if you choose not to, I'm not going to cut you off and I'm not going to say you're not a Christian and you're still going to be my friend and we can still work together in the kingdom of God. Amen? It's a non-essential for salvation. I don't need that to be saved. I'm already saved. Is that, is that clear? So that's, a, that's these non-essential areas. But then in the third thing, in all things we show what? Love. So I show you love. Saying, well, if you don't want to believe that or whatever, okay, I'll still show you love. But you show me love and let me continue on in what I see in Scripture and walk in those things and experience those things. Does that make sense? And when you do that and take that idea right there, then we stay united. And we don't start to fragment over little petty things, my friends, because that's where Satan comes in and tries to kill a church. Look, be honest. Every one of you, including me, has left church. Go, I don't like with that person. I don't like this. Can you just stop that? Because what you're doing is the beginning of dividing something. Okay, so you don't like something. Or you didn't, just keep it to yourself. Why are you going to recruit? Why are you going to put somebody on you? Why are you going to put something in someone else's head that they don't need in their head? Does that make sense? Yes, so you want to unite the body of Christ. So he prays for our fellowship. Now, with that said, let me say this, that Jesus is into us being in fellowship, into being one and coming together. Jesus, the scriptures, God the Father, they are not in favor of isolated Christianity. Is that right? And not in favor of anybody living uh, living it by themselves. Now, when a person walks alone in their faith, apart from fellowship, not going to be in fellowship, not going to be around people, does Satan, is he more apt to pick them off? Yeah, I can show you in the Old Testament where he does stuff like that. I can show you stuff like that. He's going to pick you off. But here's the other thing. 
When you're walking by yourself and you're not in a fellowship with other believers in the body of Christ, your spiritual thinking goes a little crazy. Has anybody ever noticed that? Your spiritual thinking will go a little off. And sometimes it goes a lot of off, okay? Because you need, you, know, you need people acting upon your mind spiritually to keep it on course. Now, let me give you an example. Um, I, as I feel led in life, I periodically, if I see a homeless person and I feel like when God speaks, I'm, I go buy them food. That's just what I do. I'm sure you do too. Um, one homeless person told him I said hi. Um, I just love saying that. Um, one homeless person, I'm, I was sitting, I was there one day, and you know I have a lot of backpacking equipment, and a lot of it I don't use anymore. And some of it's older, but it's still good. And I thought, you know, God said, you know, why you have that tent? You have so many other tents. Go give it to somebody. And so I found somebody. I gave it to, I gave it to them and to sleep in bed because it was so cold one night. And I went driving around looking for somebody to give it to. You. But, you know, I just do these things. And so, but when I, when I give things to people like that, I, I, I talk to them a little bit and I'll ask, what, what's your name? Because how many people don't even ask them their name anymore? And this is a human being, you know? And so I'll, I'll, I'll just do stuff like that. Now, here's the thing I want to tell you. They're alone out there. Many of them, they've just been alone for a long time. One guy I was talking to about three weeks ago, he'd been, he, I go, how long have you been out? He goes, five years. Five years. I go, oh gosh. When I talk to a homeless person, high percentage of the time, there's just a little bit something off in their thinking. Have you ever noticed that? They'll start talking right now, all of a sudden they go, I go, oh, that's way off, man. Because they've been alone for a long time. Because their mind is not being acted upon by other folks, by other people. And what you see in the homeless community also can happen to Christians when it comes to the Word of God. If a Christian is not in fellowship, not with others, then they'll go off, they'll start to interpret the way they want to interpret. And they go off. I mean, I had one happen to me on Sunday. Somebody said this to me, and I said, no, that's not correct. I said, it's got to be this, 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 and this. And they're like, oh, yeah, no, you're, that's wrong, that's wrong. And uh, you just have to correct those things. But you have to be in fellowship. It's very important. Otherwise, the spiritual mind starts to go off in what it thinks and feels. And you can't go with what you think and feel. You go with what God says. Amen? Now, let's move on. The point, third point is this. Jesus prays for protection from the destroyer. He prays for protection from the destroyer. Now, let me read verses 12 through 15. And it says this. While I was with them... I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me. And I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition. Now, perdition means ruin, or to catastrophe, to ruin. So that the, and that's obviously um, uh, Judas. So that the scripture would be fulfilled. But now, I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. Verse 14. I have given them your, your word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. Oh, protection from the destroyer. Notice in the text, he said that we are in the world, but we are not what? But we're not of this world. Oh, now, when you see the word world in that kind of a context, um, just as I'm, I'm sure most of you know this, but let's just rehearse it. It's not the earth. He's not talking about being on earth. He's talking about a world system. He's talking about the thinking within the world system out there that's governed by the enemy. That's what exactly he is talking about. Now, not in your notes, but I'm going to show you two verses very quickly to kind of give you more, a little bit wider look on that. Is that Okay. So uh, keep your marker here and turn to your right. Let's go to 1 John chapter 5. We're going to hit him and run real quick. 1 John 5. Now, now watch this. When you're in 1 John 5, say I'm there. Okay, you're not there yet. Okay. 
Okay, now, look at verse 19, 1 John 5, 19. It says this, We know that we are of God, and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So now we know this whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Now watch what Peter says, back up to your left, just a few pages. Don't go too far. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. When you're there, say I'm there. Okay. Now look at verse 11. Watch what Peter says about him and us and all of us. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against the soul. What did Peter feel like as he traveled through the world? I'm an alien and a stranger here. I don't fit in this place. This world system is not the system that I, that, uh, that I believe in. You know, it's called a worldview. And so in that, now we find that we're in this world, we're in this system. When Adam sinned, he handed it all over to the devil, to Satan, and now that's the prevailing thinking in this world. Don't you ever feel like at times, I just don't fit on planet Earth anymore? Anybody ever feel that? I, I feel that a, a lot of times. Just, I don't fit here anymore. This is crazy. So Jesus prays for protection because like when a computer gets a virus, Adam sins and the virus comes in and takes control of everything and you and I walk in hostile territory now. And sometimes when we share the word of God, they can get hostile toward us. Can they not? A, yeah, just so you know. Now, here's the question. How does he keep us from the evil one? Don't you want to know that? Because that's what he's praying, that they would be kept from the evil one. So there's some practical stuff here. So let me give you the first one. Keep your mark here. Turn to Job in the Old Testament. You go back to Psalms, and right before Psalm is Job. And when you go to Job, he's about 40-some chapters, and go back to chapter 1, and we'll get, when you get to Job, we're going to look at Job chapter 1, verse 6 through 12. Let's see the first way how God keeps the evil one from us. Now in Job 1, look at verse 6 now. He says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Interesting, huh? That Satan still has access to the throne of God, and he does. He no longer has position, but he has access. And in Revelation, there'll come a moment when he no longer has access, he will be booted away from that for good. Verse 7. The Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from me. Well, God says, Have you thought about dealing with this guy? How would you like God to do that for you, huh? No, but look at verse 9. Then Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for nothing? Now, Job, now, Satan's getting pretty angry. He's testing things. Verse 10. Have you not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. In other words, why is the only reason Job worships you? Because his life is good. Because you bless him. Because his crops are growing. That's the only reason he, he, he worships you and follows you. And then Satan says this, put forth your hand now and touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to your face. He says, take that all away from him. He'll curse you to your face, verse, verse 12. Then the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put forth your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. Question, what was Satan now allowed to do? Take everything away. Except what couldn't he do? Couldn't touch him. Couldn't hurt him. So what does that tell us about when God prays for our protection from the evil one? Satan is on a leash, is he not? There are parameters put on him. God just doesn't let him run really nilly in our lives. There is a leash on that guy. And know that God has his hand on the leash. Amen. So always remember that. Now, that's the first way he prays for him. Now, turn over. Let me give you another way that God prays for protection for us or another way that it works when God gives us wisdom, I should say. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4 in your New Testament. Now, watch this. If you want to be protected from the evil one, here's how it works. You've got to go with me a little faster now so I can finish tonight. 
Ephesians 4. When you're there, say I'm there. Okay. In Ephesians 4, now watch this. Look at verse 27. It says, and do not give the devil what? Don't give him an opportunity. The word opportunity, the Greek word is topos. Um, uh, we use topography maps, backpacking. A topography map is the, the terrain. And we use these maps or pieces of a whole. So don't give him a terrain. Don't give him an area of your life. Don't give him a topos in your life. So what does that mean? Well, in Romans, Paul says in Romans, you can write this down, um, 13, 14, chapter 13, verse 14. He says, make no provision for the flesh. In other words, don't put yourself in a position where your flesh is going to be tempted and you're going to fall to these temptations. Correct? So now you see God protects us through wisdom. Don't put yourself in situations. Don't set yourself up to sin. Now, with that said, I have my umbrella right here. I brought it as a prop. I know it's not going to rain until Saturday, but let me give the illustration. Are you ready for the illustration? No, I'm joking. Okay. When it rains, as it did this morning, how many of you use an umbrella? Okay. Did you walk through the rain like this? No. If you did, we're going to talk to you later because there's problems. There are problems. No, you wear the, you hold the umbrella up top, right? Because you want to stop the rain from hitting you. Correct? Now, this is the way one of the aspects of protection from the evil one works. We have the Word of God. Do we not? Yes. Now, when I walk in the Word of God, I am under the umbrella of God's protection. Am I not? Yes. When I walk out of the Word of God, what happens? I'm outside the umbrella of God's protection. And now Satan can rain down on me, can he not? And it's not God's fault. It's not the leash on Satan's fault. It's that I have chosen to walk outside of that umbrella of protection. Have I not? Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. And so it's very important that we know the word of God and we stay under the umbrella of protection, which is the word of God. Amen. Let me just put this down right there. Now, okay. Moving on. There's another prayer that he prays for protection. Number four in your notes, and that's this. They are sanctified in the word of God. They are sanctified that we are sanctified in the word of God. Now look at verse, um, I'll read verse 16, 17. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the what? The truth. Your word is, is truth. That's right. So sanctified, simple definition is you're set, af set apart for God's purpose uh, in, in life, okay? <clears throat> now, the other way now that we see that we're protected from the evil one is we dive into God's word, stay in God's word. Okay, so um, you're going to get more of this as I get older. M my grandkids, let me talk about them. Yeah, so, so my son Nathan, <clears throat> he lives, we have to drive over Cahalco. You ever drive Cahalco, Lake Matthews? Okay. Yeah. Long-term coronal residence, I've driven over many times. Now I drive over that thing constantly because I want to go see those grandkids, Nolan, Lincoln, and they have another one on the way. If you ever drive over that, um, you, when you go along the Lake Matthews part, and it, it does this kind of curving thing, but the way the street is, that if you veer off that lane a little bit, it's got all these notched grooves in the road. So if you veer off to the side, you're going to hear something. What do you hear? <laughs> what does that tell you? That you're in trouble, guy. You need to get back in the lane. Because if you veer off this way or veer off that way, some bad stuff can happen. And see, that's what the Word of God does. He says, sanctify them in the word. If I'm set apart in the word of God and it's really transforming my thinking, then when I veer off, I'm going to hear the, in the spirit in a sense, I'm off. And I got to get back in that lane. And that's what God does, you know, as he convicts us. Now, Jesus said that sanctify them in, in, in truth. Thy word is true. In other words, question, is there absolute truth? Yes, people will say there is no absolute truth, right? Right? People say that. So let's rehearse again some simple things. If somebody tells you there is no absolute truth, what is the simplest thing you might say to them? 
Is that absolutely true? Because when they say there's no absolute truth, what have they just stated? That's an absolute truth for them. So they just contradicted themselves. If you just think about what they're saying, you just say, is that absolutely true? Now, when somebody, when you share the truth with somebody, and this is absolute truth, and I've shared with this before, but let's rehearse it. And people say, you ever heard this one? I have my own truth. Has anybody ever heard that? I have my own truth. Okay, here's what you might want to try. Okay? You might want to say to them, I'm not being funny, I'm just, because you got to use logic now. You ask them, do you have your own math too? And they go, what do you mean? I say, okay, well, let's say you go to the bank and you only have $500. That's all you got in there. But you go there and you say to the teller, I want to pull out $1 million. And the teller looks at you. They call the manager. The manager looks at the records and says, you don't have $1 million. You only have $500. But you say to them, you go, well, but that's, that's your math. My math says I have a million dollars. Are they going to give you a million dollars? Because just because you have your own math doesn't mean your math is right, huh? And just because you have your own truth doesn't mean your truth is right, right? And so you go with God's word. So there's all kinds of logical ways to dialogue these things out. But you've got to think them and you've got to rehearse them so that you, when you question it, you know what you're talking about. He wants us sanctified in the truth. Now, the fifth thing is this, that we follow his example. The fifth thing he prays is that we follow his example. Now, verse 18 to 23. Let me read them. As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. For, the sakes, for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Now, he says, I want you perfected in unity. And the way he describes it is, is the way him and the Father are in unity. So the Godhead is in perfect unity, is it not? Okay, why is unity so important? He said it. He said the unity of church people is very important so that the world may believe that you sent me. Our unity is a testimony. Hold that thought. I'll finish with this statement in a second. Let me read a few verses and then I'm going to come back to that statement. Verse 24. Let me finish out the chapter then I'll finish with this quick thing. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me and where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me. For you love me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and I have made your name known to them, and will make it known, so that the love which, with which you love me may be in them, and I in them. Now, look back at verse 21, so I can finish off on that verse. The reason unity among believers is important is in verse 21 that they may all be one even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Okay. You, you've heard me share this story before. It's the best story I got and I'll share it till the day I don't preach anymore on the evidence of that because when it happened, I, it was like, Wow. Some of you remember the name Jay Millard. He's passed away. He passed away almost six years ago. He started coming to church New Beginnings back in the 90s. And we had no building. We had nothing like that. And so we were moving our offices from Maple Avenue over to California Street, and we had to build offices in the back. 
So he came to help out, and he'd been coming to church for so many months now. And he came on his motorcycle, and he helped out. And after we built the offices, he made an appointment to come and see me. No, okay. And he comes in my office, and he sits down, and we're chatting back and forth. And I said, well, finally I go, well, why do why'd you want to see me? And he looks at me, and he says, and I'll never forget the words. He goes, it must be real. I don't even know what he's talking about. I go, what, what, what? He goes, it must be real. And then I realized he's not saved because, you know, I'm really quick on the discernment. <laughs> he's not saved. He's been coming for a while. He's not saved. He came to help us build offices. He's not saved. And I said, what do you mean? And here's what he told me. I've been around guys working on projects and building stuff. I've never been around guys where guys don't get mad at each other in situations like this, where they don't yell at each other, where they don't get into fights with each other. I've never seen this before. Everybody got along. And then he reiterated his statement, it must be real. And I got to lead him to the Lord in the office that he helped build on California Avenue right there below Home Depot and Sam's Club. I got to lead him to the Lord. And he became a very great servant in our church. He saw the unity. He saw people getting along. And it led him to the reality that Jesus must be real. Because how else can this happen? Amen. Let's pray. And it is real. And you are real, Jesus, in our life. And you're so real that you intercede for us. And you pray all these things for us because you ever intercede for us. Thank you, Lord, that you keep Satan on a leash. Thank you, Jesus, that we're in this place, but we're not of this system. We've been saved out of it. Thank you, God, for your goodness to us, that we have your word, that we're sanctified in that word, that we can walk under the umbrella of protection of that word. Thank you. Thank you that we get to know you. That is eternal life, that we may know him. Thank you, Jesus. And so, Lord, we're grateful tonight, God. Keep us safe on the way home. In Jesus' name, amen.